Ben Jamal is the director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. And we're going to be talking today about the 75th anniversary of the Nakba and what Palestine Solidarity Campaign has been doing to commemorate that. Before we delve into any of that, I just wanted to say a massive welcome to you, Ben. Thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Well, thanks so much for, for joining us, Ben. Um, so to kick things off, uh, for, for some of our viewers might not be aware of the Nakba and what it is. So I wondered if you could just talk us through what the Nakba is or was and why Nakba Day is commemorated. Yeah, sure. And the Nakba um, is the Arabic word for uh, catastrophe. Um, and it describes the process um, of ethnic cleansing that occurred in 1948, really actually between 1947 and 1949, um, when over 750,000 Palestinians uh, were expelled or forced to flee uh, from their homes in what became the state of Israel. So that was 80% of the Palestinian population and more than 500 uh, towns and villages were destroyed, uh, wiped off the face of the earth and many massacres undertaken. But actually, I think I would say, um, really to understand that process in the Nakba, you have to go back before and in some ways one could argue that the Nakba began or certainly the foundations of the Nakba began to be laid at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, when the ideology of Zionism began uh, to be formed, became a political movement. And this in essence was the idea uh, that the way of dealing uh, with the appalling persecution of Jewish people across Europe was for Jewish people to found their own state, which eventually became a claim of a right to establish a state in historic Palestine. And then of course, in 1917, the British Foreign Secretary Balfour issued a declaration where he said that the British government uh, supported uh, that aim. This was despite the fact that when that declaration was issued, um, once described as one people, uh, the British giving the land that belonged to another people to a third people. The population of Palestine at that time was 94% Palestinian Arab and only 6% Jewish. So that laid the foundations. Then, of course, after the First World War, uh, the League of Nations gave Britain control over the territory of Palestine under a mandate. And Britain oversaw a process of increasing uh, the immigration of Jewish people, mostly from Europe, but also from elsewhere. Uh, but by the end of the Second World War, the population was still uh, predominantly Palestinian Arab, 35% uh, Jewish population. Uh, but in 47, as I say, the process of Zionist forces prior to the establishment of the State of Israel began this process of ethnic cleansing that enabled the State of Israel to be founded with a Jewish majority, but only on the basis of having expelled the Palestinian population, including my grandparents uh, and all of my uh, extended family. And so you've obviously talked there about the, the history there in terms of the, the foundation of the State of Israel and the, the role of Britain in, in that and so on. And obviously the, the, the history behind this is important to understand the, the, the situation that we see in Palestine today. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what what you, what you think the, the relevance and importance of the, the Nakba is in Palestine as we find it today. Yes, and one of the, that's a very important question, and one of the messages you know, yesterday, um, as your viewers will, I'm sure, know, uh, more than 10,000 people marched uh, through London and a march that we had organized in solidarity with the Palestinian people who were commemorating this weekend, the Nakba. But a key message of that march is that the Nakba is commemorated not as a moment of collective and personal trauma rooted in the historical past, but as an ongoing process of colonization, 
um, of dispossession uh, and, and of enforcement of a system of oppression uh, through uh, brutal militarized means. And again, it's worth looking at the history since 1948, but, but what that means for Palestinians now. Um, Palestinians post-1948, those who lived in the state of Israel, so 20% of the population of Israel remained Palestinian Arab. Those were um, the 20% of Palestinians that were not expelled. They were subject up until 1967 uh, to a life under military rule. So uh, despite the fact that they were um, technically citizens of the state, they were subject to military law. Um, that ended in 1967, but since then, Palestinian citizens of the state live under a whole body of laws that treat them as second-class citizens that deny them full equality under the law. One example is a law that allows towns of a certain size inside Israel to elect committees that can decide who can live in the town. And this law allows those committees to exclude Palestinians from moving into these towns so that they can remain Jewish only on the basis that they might disturb, uh, the wording is, you might disturb the social and cultural harmony of the town. And of course, in 1967, Israel uh, occupied the remaining areas of historic Palestine that up to that point were ruled since 47 by Jordan and Egypt. Uh, and that's Gaza, uh, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem, occupied those areas, uh, began a process uh, of settlement that has continued in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. So Palestinians there still live under military occupation and Israel is settling those areas, moving hundreds of thousands of settlers in violation of international law, taking Palestinian land to form towns for those Jewish settlers and depriving the rights of the Palestinian people who live there under a completely separate system of law. And Gaza uh, was also subject to settlement up to 2007, but at that point Israel removed the settlers, uh, but then imposed a siege on Gaza that continues to this day. Uh, even David Cameron, not um, known as a friend of the Palestinian people, once described Gaza as the world's largest open air uh, prison. Um, Israel controls the borders, controls who goes in, who goes out, even how much food Palestinians uh, can uh, receive going across the border. That continues to this day. Uh, and of course, Israel subjects uh, Gaza to periodic military assaults. We've seen that in the past week. Maybe I can say a little bit more about that. Uh, and there are regular militarized attacks on Palestinians living in East Jerusalem uh, and the West Bank. All of that together, Palestinians have been asserting this for decades, but now there's a consensus across the human rights community. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, even B'Tselem, Israel's own leading human rights monitoring organization, have all in the last 18 months produce forensic reports that detail how this whole system of oppression, working in different ways, but across the whole territory of historic Palestine, in totality meets the definition of a system of apartheid. So I want to, I want to talk about um, the airstrikes in Gaza. Um, but before I do that, the last thing you mentioned there, I wanted to pick up on, because you, you described the, the system that's in place as meeting the definition of apartheid. Now, um, there are if you were to say that on other media outlets that would be deemed to be quite a controversial uh statement now for me i think you know looking at the situation it demonstrably is the case that we are seeing a system of apartheid but why do you think it is that that um that that claim that argument that essentially israel is operating as an apartheid state is so controversial well it's i mean it's worth saying this first of all um it the, the idea of regarding this as a disputable claim or even a controversial claim um, is an idea um, promulgated by Israel really in order to close down conversation um, and to shield it from accountability. But it really isn't a controversial claim. It's not a term used in a pejorative way. In other words, it's not a term used to say we disapprove or we think this is... Um, somehow 
problematic. It's a term that's used very, very precisely. Apartheid has a legal definition. It's defined under the Rome uh, statute. Um, and those reports, as I say, Palestinians have been asserting this for decades. Um, but one of the uh, tragedies um, of this situation is that Palestinian voices are often silenced, are not seen as relevant. Um, uh, but now the world is waking up to this because, as I said, of the reports from Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and Betzalem. Amnesty's in particular is forensic in detail, several hundred pages that goes into meticulous detail demonstrating why in accordance with all of the aspects of the legal definition of apartheid, this system meets that definition. Sometimes people say, well, it can't be apartheid because it doesn't look exactly like South African apartheid. In other words, they will look at the state of Israel and say, well, the Palestinians can vote. Um, you can even have Palestinian members of the parliament. Black South Africans were never given those rights. And that's a misnomer. South African apartheid um, was a particular version of the system of apartheid as defined under the Rome statute. Um, and it is true that Palestinians can vote and Palestinians can stand to be members of the Knesset. But what they can do as members of the Knesset is limited. They cannot change the fundamental system. They cannot change the basic laws uh, that effectively enforce a whole body of laws, as I said, that in all sorts of ways, in terms of their rights of property ownership, in terms of their rights of settlement, uh, in terms of a whole broad range of rights, say actually they're second class citizens. Desmond Tutu actually said, um, in his view, uh, what he witnessed uh, when he made one of his several visits um, to Palestine was that Palestinians were suffering a worse form of apartheid than he experienced living as a black South African under South African apartheid. So it really isn't a controversial claim. Israel wants to make it a controversial claim and also absurdly um, wants to indicate uh, through this process of trying to redefine how we understand the hatred of the Jewish people, anti-Semitism, by saying it's actually anti-Semitic to use that label against Israel. That's obviously nonsensical. If the claim is accurate and can be um, backed up by evidence, then of course, how can it um, be a manifestation of hatred um, of a, a people? And that's and and where Israel now finds itself um, is in the very difficult place of having to convince the world that the various human rights lawyers, that the United Nations Special Rapporteur, that the Human Rights Watch, that Amnesty International, in asserting this claim and providing the evidence, are all um, stating anti-Semitic narratives, are all anti-Semitic organisations. So next, I wanted to talk about, um, I guess, what's what's happening on the ground right now. So over the last week or so, we've seen Israel launching a series of airstrikes in Gaza. Can you talk us through what's happening on the ground in Palestine right now? Yeah, so obviously, um, people would have seen this is one of those moments um, where some news about what's happening to the Palestinian people does break through to a degree to the mainstream, but it only tends to break through at moments where um, the, the descriptor that is used is there's been an escalation of violence. Usually this is also framed as Israel defending itself against a renewal of violence from Palestinians. Um, but it's usually only regarded as newsworthy when in intense periods, lots of Palestinians are dying. So that does break through to the news or there are uh, Israeli casualties. Um, and in the past week, what we've seen uh, in Gaza is a renewal of strikes. The first strikes were launched by Israel. 33 Palestinians have been killed, including many children. Uh, we now have a ceasefire in Gaza, but this is an ongoing process. And actually, generally, there's a period of about a year, sometimes two years. We saw similar attacks last August that lasted a similar period of time, about a week. And of course, people remember in May 2021, we had a far more intensive process of Israeli bombardment over that month, killing 
260 Palestinians, including 67 children. One Israeli, Israeli military spokesperson once described this process uh, as mowing the lawn, uh, that every couple of years we need to effectively remind the Palestinians um, as any form of resistance to Israel's oppression grows, we need to remind them of who holds military power. And so Palestinians are killed intensively. And then usually what happens, as I say, is we hear across the mainstream media uh, and across the political mainstream, two narratives really. One, that Israel has a right to defend itself. And of course, the answer to that is any form of violence used um, to implement and sustain uh, a system of oppression that violates international law and human rights is by definition illegitimate. And Palestinians under international law have a right to defend themselves against the system of apartheid and against military occupation. But the second narrative we always hear is, well, what's required now is a ceasefire. Uh, what's needed is an end to the violence, a de-escalation, so we can return to calm. But what calm means for Palestinians, we're seeing it right now. Right now, yesterday, a ceasefire has been declared. It will probably hold. Uh, but what happened immediately? Well. The day after the ceasefire, yesterday, after the ceasefire had been declared, more Palestinians were killed in the West Bank. And this continues a period, a, a, a process of ongoing repression that has been ramped up since the beginning of 2023 under an Israeli government that is the most ultra-nationalist far-right Israel's ever elected. Since the beginning of 2023 in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, Israel has killed over 150 Palestinians at the rate of roughly one a day. That doesn't tend to break through into the mainstream. Uh, individual Palestinians being killed is not newsworthy. Um, it's only newsworthy if they uh, resist, if they respond, and there are Israeli casualties. So that's an ongoing process, this pro process of ongoing repression. And of course, alongside of all of that, um, People in Gaza woke up today to a ceasefire. The bombs have stopped falling, but they woke up still living under a siege that has made life there. Uh, the UN, UN once said if it wasn't lifted by 2020, then life would be unfit for human habitation. And it hasn't been lifted. And it continues. Uh, over the past week, 50 homes have been destroyed and another thousand Palestinians rendered homeless. Uh, that process continues. It's a process of deliberate de-development of Gaza. That's still ongoing in Gaza. And whilst Palestinians, as I say, uh, are subject to violent repression that's killed 150 in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, they're also subject to house demolitions. Last week, we saw a Palestinian primary school demolished. Uh, they are subject to the ongoing theft of their land, to the deprivation of their rights of movement, of assembly, significant proportions of the Palestinian population are illegitimately detained in administrative detention. So all of this process, you don't, you are unable to sustain a military occupation on the people who choose not to be occupied without that constant threat of violence and constant means of brutal repression. So before I ask you um, what people in the UK can do to support the Palestinian people, um, you talked there about the the current government in Israel being, you know, ultra nationalist, and the, I mean, you know, we've seen over the last decade essentially the, the Israeli government move further and further and further to the right, even after the various iterations it's been under. But one of the things we've seen in the last six months is um, in Israel itself, in response to um, Benjamin Netanyahu's attempted judicial overhaul, a mass movement. Um, campaign against those uh, judicial reforms and against the Israeli government. Now, I spoke to um, Daniel Bett from Yakad recently. Yakad is a, is a Zionist organization, but one that campaigns um, for, um, for a so-called peace uh, a settlement with, with, with Israel. Um, now, I spoke to Daniel about those protests and whether um, they'd seen a a shifting in Israeli attitudes towards the occupation, given there's been this quite substantial, I mean, historically unprecedented within Israel, resistance to the Israeli government on a particular issue, whether that shifted attitudes towards the occupation and whether that um, had, uh, yes, yeah, started to change 
the way that Israeli citizens saw the occupation. And um, she said that she she could see that starting to happen. That was something that the Palestinian ambassador to the UK very much disagreed with. In an interview with Navarra Media, he said that uh, there had been no shift and people hadn't been making connection between the Israeli government's policies there and in terms of occupation. What's your sense of, 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 of that? Do you think that the movement against the judicial overhauls could translate into some solidarity between Israeli citizens and, and Palestinians around the occupation? Well, um, I'd say this, and, and you're right, there have been very, very significant protests um, from opposition forces on the ground in Israel, unprecedented in terms of the scale of them. And we had the unusual experience. Netanyahu visited um, a month or so ago. And as always, we met him with the demonstration. We had the unusual experience of having uh, a couple of hundred yards along from us uh, on the pavement in Whitehall, a demonstration of expatriate uh, Israelis and liberal Zionists protesting against his visit uh, with Israeli flags. Now, um, here is the issue, uh, and the ambassador is right about this. What is the substance of the protests? What were those protesting outside Downing Street protesting about? And they were protesting um, on the basis of Netanyahu's government being a threat um, to the to Israeli democracy, so that Israeli democracy was in peril. And in particular, they were focused on his attacks on the independence of Israel's uh, judiciary. And that is true. This far-right government is threatening the democratic rights of Jewish citizens of Israel. And it is also, um, alongside being um, the most ultra-nationalist far-right government, the most misogynistic and homophobic government uh, that Israel uh, has ever elected. So it is threatening the democratic rights of Jewish citizens. But the reality for Palestinians is that Israel has never been a democracy. The judiciary whose independence those protesters are so concerned about is the same judiciary that has green-lighted many of the laws I spoke about that discriminate against Palestinians, has, has green-lighted uh, the right for Israel in defiance of international law to settle on Palestinian land, to colonize Palestinian land. Uh, so for Jewish citizens, uh, this government represents uh, a difference in kind. For Palestinians, it represents a difference in degree. Now, is there anything that is positive about these protests? Well, there is in one way, which is what it is doing is opening up a conversation for people uh, about holding Israel to account, which um, that notion that Israel should be treated like any other state, uh, that when it violates international law, it should be held to account, that when um, it has policies that are deeply problematic in terms of repression of rights, it should be held to account, is, is a narrative that is suppressed when it comes to its treatment of Palestinians and is seen as, uh, as politically illegitimate. But what we've seen here is people beginning a conversation about uh, holding Israel to account. We have seen uh, the European Union recently saying it would not hold a meeting with Ben Gavir, one of the ministers in the Israeli government who's a self-declared proud racist, and proud fascist. Um, we have seen Jewish business leaders in the States threatening to withdraw investments from Israel unless Netanyahu uh, changes policy. They're not concerned in relation to the rights of Palestinian people, but what it is doing is actually opening up the space um, to say, actually, Israel needs to be held to account in the same way that any state violating international law and human rights should be held to account through sanctions and through processes of boycott and diversity. So that leads me perfectly onto my final question for you, which is how can people in the UK today support the struggle for liberation for the Palestinian people? And Chris, there's um, there's a very simple answer I can give to that. And um, Omar Barghouti, the co-founder of the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, always gives a very good answer. I've um, had the privilege of being alongside him on many platforms. And um, for those of your viewers who um, received the Tribune, you would have seen an interview with Omar Barghouti where he repeats this assertion. Um, and also that interview 
um, that's in the Tribune. Uh, if you go on PSC's YouTube, you can see the full full interview with the editor of the Tribune. And he says, I'm always asked this question, what can we do to support you? And I said, I always give the same answer, which is do us no harm. And what does that mean? It means end your complicity. And what does that mean? Well, what Omar is talking about is the reality that Israel cannot sustain its system of apartheid, just as South Africa couldn't, without the complicit support of governments internationally, of public bodies, and of companies and corporations. So what is asked of us is not an act of solidarity that's an act of charity or simple em empathy, but is an act that seeks to end British complicity. That means uh, taking action to end the complicity of our government, which continues to support Israel militarily, diplomatically, uh, financially. But it means targeting complicit companies like Barclays that continue to provide the financing for, for um, the companies that are arming Israel. Uh, it means targeting companies like Puma, uh, who sponsor the Israeli Football Association that has football teams in settlements um, that are you know, illegal settlements on Palestinian land. So those are the actions we need to take. We also have a very specific task because um, the growth of the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement globally uh, is what gives us most optimism about the potential for Israel to be held to account. But Israel is reacting to that. And it is doing that by trying to persuade allies across the globe to introduce laws to try to suppress support for boycott, divestment and sanctions. We are about to see here in the UK our own version of such a law the anti-boycott law that is going to effectively stop public bodies. So uh, local councils, local government pension schemes, universities, if they want to make decisions um, not to invest in companies that are complicit in violations of international law or human rights abuses, that they will not be able to do that unless the government itself uh, supports taking action against uh, those states. That threatens not just the rights of people who want to campaign on Palestine, but also those who want to campaign on other issues, fossil fuel divestment. And that's why we've been successful in bringing together a coalition of more than 60 organisations, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, Liberty, the Quakers, the Methodist Church, Amnesty International, many, many others who are coming together to say um, this violates fundamental rights of freedom of expression. It violates our right to say that public bodies have a responsibility uh, to invest ethically and this law must be opposed so that's one task for everybody come together put pressure on members of parliament put pressure on members of the house of lords to defeat this bill but also as we defend the space join um, boycott divestment and sanctions campaign so israel is held to account in the same way that every state should be held to account uh, if it seeks to trample on human rights or violate international law Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Good to be here.